Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Welcome to my video on an introduction to one-way ANOVA. As always, if you find this video helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. I certainly appreciate it. A one-way ANOVA is a one-way analysis of variance. That's what ANOVA stands for, analysis of variance. And it's an inferential statistic that tests to see if there's a difference between means in three or more unrelated groups. So the example I'm going to use in this video would be a study where you have 90 participants and you have 30 participants in a cognitive behavioral therapy counseling treatment, 30 participants in psychodynamic treatment, and 30 participants in a control group. So in this instance there's one independent variable, treatment, and three levels, CBT, psychodynamic, and control. So the analysis of variance would be used in this example to determine if there's a difference between the means of the CBT group, the psychodynamic group, and the control group on some dependent variable, let's say a measure of depression. So the null hypothesis for analysis of variance is that the means of each level are the same. So on this depression variable, this instrument that measures depression, the means for CBT, for psychodynamic, and for the control group would all be the same. That's the null hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is that there is a mean difference between at least two levels. So if we have a statistically significant result following a one-way ANOVA, we don't know where the difference is. So we have to run a post hoc test. So in the example of the CBT, psychodynamic, and control, it could be between CBT and psychodynamic, CBT and control, or psychodynamic and control. We wouldn't know where the difference is until we run a post hoc test. And of course, there could be more than just one difference. All the groups could be different from all the other groups. Now, one-way analysis of variance is applicable for three or more groups. If you only have two groups, you can still use analysis of variance. And this would give you the same result as an independent samples t-test. With an independent samples t-test, you have a dichotomous independent variable, two groups, one independent variable, and it produces a probability value. With an ANOVA, if you only used two levels of one independent variable, you would get the same probability value. So let's take a look at the elements of a one-way ANOVA. We have the one independent variable. So in the example I used, it was treatment. We have three or more levels in this independent variable. And the example I used, CBT, psychodynamic, and a control group. And this is a between subjects design. So a participant that is assigned to the CBT group, for instance, cannot also be assigned to one of the other two groups. They have to be independent or unrelated groups. In a one-way ANOVA, you also have one dependent variable, and it's measured at the interval or ratio level of measurement. This is also known as continuous. So the only difference between interval and ratio is that with a ratio, with a ratio level of measurement, you have a true zero. So I like to use the example for interval of the Fahrenheit scale of temperature. The zero degrees in the Fahrenheit scale doesn't represent an absence of heat. So that scale doesn't have a true zero. It has a zero, but not a true zero. However, it does qualify as interval because as you move up one degree, that's the same amount of change in heat no matter where that movement is made. So the difference between 45 and 46 degrees is the same as the difference between 57 and 58 degrees. The ratio level of measurement does have a true zero. So one example of that would be weight as measured in pounds. Zero pounds is an absence of weight. It represents no weight, so it has a true zero. Now let's take a look at the assumptions for a one-way ANOVA. So by assumptions, every time we look at data, 
and we want to analyze data with an inferential statistic, those data have to meet certain assumptions. And there are three assumptions for one-way ANOVA. The first is normality. The residuals must be normally distributed for each level of the independent variable. So what does this mean? So consider the example with the CBT, psychodynamic, and the control group, and a dependent variable of depression. If you take the residuals for that dependent variable for each level of the independent variable, so the residuals for CBT, residuals for depression, and residuals for the control group, all three of those groups of residuals must be normally distributed. So that's three tests of normality, one for each level of the independent variable. So how can we check for normality? Well, there are a variety of methods to determine if a distribution is normal. One of the tests is the Shapiro-Wilk. And with the Shapiro-Wilk test, if you have a p-value of less than 0 0.05, you would say that that variable is not normally distributed. And a p-value of greater than 0 0.05, you would say the variable is normally distributed. But I wouldn't just run one test like the Shapiro-Wilk. The Shapiro-Wilk is a test that provides information to help you determine normality. But you'd also want to look at the skewness and kurtosis of distribution and take a look at the histogram for that variable as well. If you fail to meet the assumption of normality, you have a few options with ANOVA. A one-way ANOVA is robust to violations of normality. However, you may want to consider a data transformation or selecting a non-parametric test like a Kruskal-Wallis test, which does not have an assumption of normality. The next assumption is the homogeneity of variances assumption. This is also known as homoscedasticity. So the variances on the dependent variable need to be the same for all of the levels of the independent variable. And oftentimes with an ANOVA, we would test the homogeneity of variances assumption using Levine's test. And if you have a probability value of less than 0 0.05, you reject the null hypothesis and you would assume that you've violated the assumption of homogeneity of variances. And if you have a p-value, probability value, greater than 0 0.05, you would fail to reject the null and assume that you have met the assumption of homogeneity of variances. If your data fail to meet the assumption of homogeneity of variances, you may consider a few different test options. One would be the Welsh test, and another would be the Brown Foresight test. The third assumption for one-way NOVA is that you have to have independence of observations. So these need to be unrelated groups, not related groups. One observation cannot be dependent on another observation. This is more of a research design issue than it is an issue of checking the data with some sort of statistical test. You meet the assumption of independence of observations through having a design, a research design, that is consistent with that assumption. Now you'll notice here in this list of assumptions that I've not included the assumption that we have an absence of outliers. Now again, as, with, as is the case with many inferential statistics, with ANOVA there is disagreement as to whether the absence of outliers is actually one of the assumptions. Some sources do list absence of outliers as an assumption. Other sources do not list it. It's my opinion that as long as you check for normality, make sure the residuals are normally distributed, and check for homogeneity of variances, that the absence of outlier assumption is not required for a one-way ANOVA. However, be aware there are differing opinions on that matter. I hope you found this introduction to one-way ANOVA to be useful. Thanks for watching.